Hello friends and welcome to episode number two of Nostalgia Talk. Before we get into it, I just want to say a few quick things. First of all, uh, I'm really, really happy that a lot of you liked episode number one with my friend and mentor, Mike Peterson. I got a lot of uh, very nice uh, messages, comments about that. Uh, so thank you all very much. And for anyone wondering, I know it's only been two days since I shot that, so for anyone wondering how often this is going to be, this is a 100% guarantee. I am not going to be filming another episode in another two days, but I am hoping to film some soon. This is more like a hobby, really. I, uh, I'm a film student, uh, and I'm in my last year at film school, and afterwards I'm going to try to get into the business. This is really more of an activity. This isn't a school project. But even when I'm in the business, I would like to continue to do, to do this. And moving on with that, I am here, kind of, over Zoom with Kevin Carlson. Good morning, Kevin. Good morning, James. Uh, so Kevin is a puppeteer who has worked, uh, some of you might know him with the Muppets. Uh, he's worked on a lot of TV and film projects over the years. Uh, most notice, most specifically, uh, Warehouse Mouse on Imagination Movers. Uh, and also, for any of you 90s lovers out there, the Adventures of Timmy the Tooth, which he co-created and performed the title character. Uh, I actually just got into that show. So, uh, welcome, Kevin. Oh, good. Uh, you're watching it on the... Thank you, thank you. You're watching it on the Peacock Network, right? Actually, I uh, bought a VHS tape from uh, Value Village. <laughs> a steam-powered VHS machine? <laughs> Still works pretty, pretty good. Like, the first time I ever used it, the quality was amazing. I was like, oh, wow, like, this... Like, you could digitize this stuff easily, but I'm not going to because I am a kid of the 90s and the 2000s. Okay, good. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's get down to business. Uh, first question, how did you first get involved in puppeteering? Well, I, uh, my, my, I was always uh, uh, fascinated by The Muppet Show with Kermit and Fozzie and Gonzo. And, and uh, when I was a teenager, I, I realized, I go, wait, there's... There's guys underneath there doing those puppets, and they're so funny and so entertaining. It's like, it, that's intriguing to me. And uh, so I kind of picked up puppets and started doing birthday parties and nice. playing with kids. A lot of my own uh, store bought puppets and nothing very special because I don't really make puppets. The puppets that I have made have always been kind of a little off, so I don't. <laughs> I, 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 I leave the, uh, the professional puppet building to the puppet builders, and some of these guys are just amazing. But um, I also started off demonstrating uh, puppets for a company that was uh, selling these puppets that uh, were fairly inexpensive at the, the Broadway department store. And so they, they set me up with a stage, and I, I had a couple pre-recorded bits, and I would uh, entertain people as they walked by in the alley of the, uh, the store. And uh, so that was my first paid gig, and from then on it was like, oh yeah, this is good. And basically, puppeteers are actors, and I, I was always acting and uh, entertaining and doing stuff. And so the beauty about doing puppets is that uh, you're not really limited to your stereotype of how I look or, you know, and you can do all kinds of characters, you know, from a Chicken McNugget to a cardboard box to a mouse, a rat, a frog, a, you know, a bear. Uh, an old woman, an old man, you know, a little boy. So uh, the, it gives you a lot of range as a character actor. And uh, so that's really fun. Because, you know, if I was just strictly acting, there's a tons of guys that are kind of in my type, you know. Uh, extremely handsome, you know. Got that going for me, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll say yes. Expecting, expecting a bigger laugh. Anyways, uh, <laughs> uh, no, but a lot of guys in my type that, you know, it, the, the field, the, the talent pool is, is big, and so I'd be competing a lot of, competing with a lot of guys my type, you know, some which are better looking than me, I'll just say that. <laughs> my next question actually was, what was your first paid puppeteering job, which actually sounds like a very nosy question, but it looks like you just answered that one for me. I um, <laughs> Do you remember the first time you ever did puppeteering on, like, television, film, like just in front of an actual camera knowing that it was going to be released to the public. Yeah, I, the, my first job was with Sid and Marty Croft. Oh, they wow. Did a, uh, they did a, a show for Oral Roberts, the uh, preacher, mm -hmm. the preacher from Tulsa, Oklahoma. 
and uh, we we did a family of puppets called the Fudge Family, mm-hmm. and uh, they would set up situations that then Oral Roberts would preachify about. And I played Grandpa Fudge, and so that was my first real character. That's the one that got me into the Union. Nice. And, uh, Grandpa Fudge, and I was the youngest. I was like 19, I think. I got my Union card, and it was like, okay, this is good. This is a good thing. Of course, that show uh, was under ridicule because a lot of the, uh, the people in Oral Roberts Church felt like the dolls were, were double dolls, and so <laughs> it was a weird thing. <laughs> But with what you were saying before about puppeteers being actors, um, that kind of goes into uh, something I've been thinking about a lot lately. Because uh, I've, like, when I talk to people like you and Matt Vogel, Marty Robinson, Peter Linz, um, and I, and you know, my friends don't know their names; they just know what characters. Like I mentioned that they're puppeteers, and they say, "Oh, well, what what characters do they do?" And I'll tell them, uh, and I'll say like, "Oh, Matt Vogel does Kermit, Big Bird, the Count." Peter Linz, he's Ernie, Harry, and my friends are like, oh, that's, um, that's interesting that you get to talk to the people who do their voices. It's right. so right. much more than that, though. Yeah, uh, not only is it the voice, but it's all the technique and the, the technical part of, of uh, puppeteering and bringing a character to life and maintaining its livelihood, you know. Yeah. Uh, I actually help teach people who want to learn puppetry for film and television. Cool. And, uh, a lot of the students that I teach, you know, it's it's they realize how hard it is holding your hand up over your hand, working and looking at the monitor and doing the whole thing. So yeah, as an actor, puppeteers are working twice as hard because you've got to transfer all of your acting everything through your arm into the puppet's head, you know. Yeah. So yeah, it's a technique that you, you can learn as an actor. You just have to be disciplined because it's hard. It's mm-hmm. hard. The last guest that I had was actually, um, as I said, it was somebody who uh, worked on Fraggle Rock. He actually was one of my puppeteering teachers uh, a couple years ago. I did a workshop in New Brunswick, which isn't that far away from where I live. And, um, uh, yeah, Mike Peterson, he's one of the best teachers I've ever had. And, Mike, if you are watching, I know that you already know that. So. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Mike. Yeah. Um, so eventually you had done uh, work with Sid and Marty Croft, um, and then it went from that to a couple other stuff, and then The Muppets. Yes, it was The Muppets on Tour, which was the live oh. arena show with the full body size uh, characters. And uh, Sesame Street Live was around for like five years before they decided to do The Muppets, and they would travel around the whole country doing these live arena shows. And I did the little puppets that were in the, in the balcony, the rats in the balcony. I also did Robin the Frog. Cute. And, and then the Muppet Babies were just on, just coming online, and, and we did a whole Muppet Babies segment, too. So so that was my uh, first time I got to meet Jim, too, on that show. And uh, that's where I met my wife as well. Aww. My wife was, uh, we were on tour together, and she, she had already been on Sesame Live for... Uh, for four years or five years. Wow. Yeah, so she was a real, uh, she, she knew how to tour. She knew how to be on the bus, you know. And uh, we fell in love and got married. Uh, she played the, and she played the role of Miss Piggy. <laughs> <laughs> that's a very sweet story that you guys met uh, on tour. That's, um, yeah, that, that really does fill my heart. Yeah, I've been married 32 years, you know, in show business. 32, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so you said that on that tour is when you met Jim Henson. Um, unfortunately, Jim Henson passed away nine years before I was born, but he's one of my idols. Him, Frank Oz, and Walt Disney. I really took inspiration from them. What was Jim Henson like? Uh, Jim was a quiet giant and, oh. and a, a, a guy who, who quiet, very quiet and, and calm and made you just feel important and he was a great great teacher director um, you know and I got to know him um, also on the 3d film too the, one of his last projects the, the uh, Muppet Vision 3d yeah yeah and one of the great stories I have with that is he was directing and um, I was doing one of the little small world characters and I was kind of in a off to the side a little bit like in the finale 
Yeah, and uh, and uh, as uh, as I was working, looking in the monitor, all of a sudden there was another little character behind me, and it was Jim. Jim had walked up in front of and started playing, and we were playing together, and it was like, oh, it doesn't get much better than that. <laughs> For him to come up behind you like that, like. Honestly, that sounds like something Richard Hunt would have done, really, from what I've heard about Richard. Yeah, Richard was that, he was that way, too. Yeah. Uh, I did want to talk a little bit about uh, Muppet Vision 3D. I saw Muppet Vision 3D when I was in Florida with my family. Uh, the Muppets movie with Jason Segel had just come out at the time. It was about six months after it came out, and it really kind of reintroduced me to the Muppets franchise, because I had been into Sesame Street. I always loved anything that Jim Henson made. But really, Sesame Street was where it all started for me. Um, so was Muppet Vision 3D your first time working as an actual Muppet performer? Well, no. Well, yes, with the guys, yeah. So but, somewhat. Muppet, who were, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, working with the guys there, yeah. With, you know, Rick Lyon and uh, Kevin Clash, Richard Hunt, Steve Whitmire, you know, Dave Goles, and Jerry Nelson was there. Uh, yeah, and it was a good group, and we shot it in L.A., which was nice, so a lot of my L.A. puppeteer colleagues were able to work on it as well. Yeah, I think Alan Trotman, who works in L.A., started on that one, too. Yeah, yeah. I helped Alan get in there. <laughs> Did you two know each other before? Yeah. In fact, Alan and I uh, trained together with uh, Sid and Marty Croft early on when they were doing, uh, they were looking for puppeteers, and they started a workshop. And Alan and I uh, were in it, as, as well as Bruce Lanoil. Um, hey, Bruce, if you are watching. Yeah, Bruce. Uh, yeah, and a few others, Terry Harden. And um, uh, there's only like 25 of us, and they auditioned like some, something like 500 people, you know. So it was quite, a, quite an honor to be in that group. And from there, that pretty much launched my career, everyone's career. Got started from there, really. Uh, so, yeah. Nice. Um, so, eventually after uh, Muppet Vision 3D, uh, uh, were, you, were you in Muppet Classic Theater? Uh, yeah. Okay. yeah, I did a lot of extra characters in that, you know, townspeople, villagers, and uh, that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, that was a good experience. Yeah, you gotta do something! We pay our taxes! What? You gotta do something about all these tidal waves here! The nearest ocean is thousands of miles away! Where did you get all this tidal wave nonsense? Oh, I should have known it was you, Shepard. Come on, everybody. Let's go home. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then after Muppet Classic Theater came the next big Muppet thing after Muppet Treasure Island, which was filmed in London. So I, I guess you weren't in that one. I missed out on that one, yeah. Rats. Um, but after Muppet Treasure Island, just shortly after Muppet Treasure Island, came Muppets Tonight. Yeah. Do you have any cool stories about working with any of the guest stars that appeared on Muppets Tonight? Uh, well, Prince was, was a guest star, and uh, Brian Henson came out and talked to all of us, and he said, okay, our, uh, our, uh, our guest is Prince, and so, but here's something we need to talk about. Um, do not look him straight in the eyes. Uh, he doesn't like it when people stare at him. And, you know, if you're looking at him, look away fast so, you, you know, don't get caught staring at him because it makes him very uncomfortable. <laughs> so, so, of course, I, I, all of us stared at him. <laughs> it's pretty hard not to when there's a big famous celebrity like yeah, Prince in the room. Yeah, but, but I love Prince, and in that, that particular episode, you really got to see a side of Prince. That, he was funny. He was a, you know, funny guy. Um, and I also remember, too, because he had to walk a, a, across a group of puppets. We were all... Uh, on the floor, but he's up on a ramp, so we're we're kind of like at, at his knees, maybe something like that. And I remember as he walked by, you know, we're, puppets are looking at him, and he's, he's walking by. And I went, "Wow, he even smells good. <laughs> smells good." <laughs> that uh, that is funny. Okay, <laughs> it's true. No, no, I I totally I totally believe you, uh, man. Prince was quite the legend. I wasn't I wasn't that big of a Prince fan, but I knew some of his stuff, like Raspberry Beret. I sometimes listen to that. I'll never forget the day that he uh, he died. I was in class, and um, one of my uh, teachers. There was my regular teacher, and there was a student teacher in the room, and she just looks at all of us out of nowhere. She's like, "Oh, 
Prince died once. He was like, no, no, I don't believe it. So I went right to Twitter, and the first thing I saw was a picture of Prince. And I looked at my friend, and I said, yeah, yeah, it's true. Prince died. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that was, that was quite a sad like, day. Yeah, he was so talented, and it's like a shooting star. I mean, and that happens to a lot of, like, famous stars. You know, mm. they kind of leave us too early. Same with Jim Henson. Left mm. us way too early. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was pretty sad. Yeah. So, Muppets Tonight, first of all, Muppets Tonight was actually really cool. I know that a lot of people have said, you know, that it's not like the original Muppet Show. It's more like a futuristic version of the original Muppet Show, because you have the behind-the-scenes stuff at a TV studio, and the Muppet Show didn't really show much of that. It just was in an old vaudeville theater. Um, so I, I really think Muppets Tonight could have worked, uh, but I think people were just too reluctant to accept it, really. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of reasons why some shows don't keep going. Some of it has to do with the executives at the studio, like in ABC or NBC or whatever. So some, some executives don't like puppets. Oh, wow. You know? What's wrong with them? <laughs> well, the big question I have there is if they don't like puppets, why did they give the get-go for the show then? Who knows? Mm. Who knows? Speaking of ABC and shows that didn't last very long, and also The Muppets, and I'm sure you know where that's going, um, do you have any cool stories about working with guest stars that appeared on the ABC Muppet Show from a few years ago? Um, yeah, uh, I, I got to work with, um, with uh, Key and Peel, Jordan Peele. Yeah, and, and they were so excited to be there. And, and they, they kind of like took a liking to it us extras, you know, doing the background characters and filling the frames and stuff. Mm -hmm. So we got to talk to them for a while. And those guys are hilarious. Oh, yeah. They were so excited. It was really a treat. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, but there was a lot of, there was a lot of celebs. Um, mm -hmm. But the, the, uh, the pace of that show was pretty daunting. We had to keep working. There was a lot to do in a short period of time. So we had to really keep moving. So we didn't have a lot of time to kind of, you know, casually have chats with Celebs and stuff like that. Aww. <laughs> yeah, I was on a show filmed here in Halifax called Mr. D. Uh, are you familiar with it? No, I'm afraid not. Okay. Um, it's, it's not, they're not doing new episodes anymore, but I was an extra twice on that show, and I got to share the screen with the star of that show, Jerry D. And on the very last day of shooting, I was on the very last episode of that show, he walked by me, and I was like, uh, can I just bother you for just a Quick picture, because I had to leave, but I was like, eh, I got a couple of minutes. And he looked like he was talking to everyone, so I was like, eh, what the heck. <laughs> Good. Yeah. yeah. Well, just remember, celebrities are people too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, with what you were saying about Key and Peele being hilarious, have you seen Have you seen their show, first of all? Well, the Key and Peele show? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I used to watch that, yeah. Okay. My favorite skit they've ever done is Obama's Anger Thought Translator. <laughs> That's a classic. And of course then you have Keegan Michael Key doing it on stage with Barack Obama. Right, yeah. Yeah, that was my first introduction to them. Um, and then I saw Toy Story 4, which they were both in. Uh, yeah. Did you see that? Yep. Yeah, they were Ducky and Bunny. Yet. Sorry? I haven't seen that yet. No. Oh, okay. Put it in my key. Okay, yeah, Toy Story 2 is my, is my favorite animated movie of all time. I felt there were some similarities between the second one and the fourth one, so I really enjoyed it. Yes. Okay, so going back to the topic of working with celebrities, you worked on one of my favorite um, Sesame Street productions, Elmo Palooza. Uh, that was actually one of my first intros to Sesame Street, and when you did that special, did you get to do any scenes with um, any, really any celebrity that was on that special, but most specifically Jon Stewart and In Living Colors, David Alan Greer? Yeah. Right. No, I, I didn't get to work on, on any of those segments. Uh, I did get to work with Sean Colvin, who's a, a folk singer. Do you like Sean? Oh, yeah. I have uh, Sunny Came Home in my uh, phone. I sometimes listen to it on my walks. Yeah. And she was great. Really enjoyed working. I didn't do a lot on that show. They came to a segment out here in L.A. Oh, wow. So they, need, 
they needed us to do right hands and stuff. And I was going to do Ernie's right hand, but then uh, there was no room in the car. There was a car that they had to drive around in. Right. So, so Ernie only had one hand that time. Oh, wow. Yeah, because I did notice in the special that uh, Drew Massey and Brad Abrell were also credited, and they, and so that, I, I guess because they work in L.A., that kind of explains how, uh, how they got to, how they got to be a part of that. Yeah. Mm. yeah. But assisting uh, Ernie with Sean Colvin, that uh, would have been pretty cool. I was actually going to... Um, uh, tell you this that my favorite scene with Ernie in that special because I thought you were doing his right hand in it was the one where Bert and Ernie were in the control room and the tape just spits out at Bert and Bert's like Ernie the machine's spitting at me and Ernie's like well gee Bert didn't the machine's mommy teach it any manners classic <laughs> yeah but you you weren't in that scene no I was not rats rats is right yeah um so with you living in L.A. and Sesame Street being shot in New York, obviously you haven't really done the actual Sesame Street series. Right. I did. When they did come here, though, uh, I worked with Kevin Clash with Hoops the Owl. Um, nice. I assisted him on that when we did, uh, like, uh, Whoopi Goldberg, we did a scene, and then with Julia Roberts, did a scene with her, too. Cool. So, yeah, that was kind of cool. Nice. Uh, do you do do you ever perform on any of their talk show appearances? Like if they're ever on Ellen or Kimmel or Kelly Clarkson Clarkson show, something like that. No, I, I uh, was I was invited to be uh, Carol Spinney's right hand for Oscar during a, a, a PBS telethon type thing. So yeah, a little bit. Yeah, I get called if, if they need assistance. Then you know it's nice to be called on. And it's great. Nice. Yeah, Carol Spinney who did. Big Bird and Oscar, just who uh, just passed away about ten months ago. Right. Yeah. So, um, can you talk a little bit about the type of puppeteering work that you've done for uh, films like Flintstones, Snow Dogs, Doctor Doolittle, where you were basically a lot of the realistic-looking animals, like, and uh, even though this wasn't a creature shop film, one that I am thinking of is the movie Charlotte's Web. Uh, with, that featured Dakota Fanning from about 15 years ago. Uh, and the animals just, they look so real, but it also looks like it could be a little bit of CG. How is that done? Well, I think, I believe they do a little bit of a hybrid kind of situation. Okay. But the, the Henson Creature Shop built those animals uh, for like Dr. Doolittle. Mm -hmm. And uh, the tiger was immaculate. They, the, they have, the, the Hensons have the, the, the best builders and the most talented uh, you know, engineers to make that thing work. And uh, it, we, for Dr. Doolittle, we were an ensemble cast. Uh, it was Dave Barkley, it was Alan Troutman, it was Bruce Lanoil, um, Ian Tregoni, um, and uh, Tom Fisher. So, uh, yeah, we, we were an ensemble. So there was five of us doing the tiger at one time. So it, we, we had to rehearse and learn how to work together to get to achieve what we needed to do. Uh, and there's a couple scenes, there's pigeons in the scene. One of my favorite things is the pigeons because you can't tell that they're manufactured, you know? They look so real. And then we, we really worked hard to get the pigeons to, you know, do what pigeons do. And that took a lot of finesse on our fingers and hands to make that happen because it had a little special gimbal type thing on the rod that we were holding up and um, I, I love that scene because it was with Eddie Murphy and uh, he's talking to them and they're having an argument but you can't tell that they're not real you know and then they 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 put the real birds in and they fly out the, the window or whatever so it, it's really a seamless uh, uh, testament to the builders and the performers to, to fool everybody that they, look, these were real pigeons you know but they weren't they were manufactured. Nice. That must be that must be really challenging having to do that uh, to make it look so real. But you do a really good job. Well, thank you. Yeah, and we studied videotape of tigers and the dog. The they, they, uh, the, the trained dog was named Lucky, and and we would watch the dog, uh, you know, and just study its movements and make sure that we kind of you know captured the essence of of that actor because <laughs> we had to you know. We had to reanimate it, kind of, you know. That's and pretty. There's, no scene, there's a scene too where, where in the in the movie that is all puppets. There's no CGI. It's just so well performed, 
and Bill Beretta was actually the uh, the head of Lucky, and he was so good, so strong. It was great. And I think I was doing like a hind leg or something. <laughs> but we're all crowded underneath the table, you know, doing the doing our business, you know. So that's part of the fun, too. Nice. Yeah, I was saying to uh, Mike the other day that it's because he was talking about performing on Labyrinth. Uh, have you seen Labyrinth? Oh, yeah. He's in the scene with uh, where Jareth and the goblins are all singing after the baby's been kidnapped and he had to have his hand coming through a wall. Right. Mm. Um, so one of my favorite film projects that you have ever been a part of is the 2011 Muppet movie featuring Jason Segel. Man, I will never forget going to that in the theater with one of my very good friends. She's not a big Muppet fan like me, but we went together uh, and my grandparents were there too. Um, and I, I just remember watching it and just being awestruck by it. It was one of the best movie-going experiences of my life. Oh, good. Yeah. good. Yep, Sunday, November 27th, 2011, and I saw it two more times in the theater after that. <laughs> good, yeah. good. No, uh, I, I think that was a, a, a good film to kind of get the, the Muppets back in the main. They have been kind of, kind of quiet for a long time. So. Oh, yeah. Because the last Muppet movie before then was Muppets from Space, which I never saw in the theater because I was only like three months old at the time. Right, mm. right. So, no, what, that was a experience we had uh, 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 the big finale was in the uh, in uh, Hollywood right on Hollywood Boulevard right in front of the El Capitan theater and the Kodak theater it's like a real popular touristy kind of place and it was all shut down so we shot that like at 2 33 in the morning oh my god, yeah. oh my god. <laughs> and it was kind of cold but then they, they it, what another funny thing about it too is that they uh, they were getting shooting the crowd like all the extras and whatever and so we w we could sneak out and get into the crowd so you can kind of see our faces if they pan across the people's faces some of us puppeteers are going <laughs> we hardly ever get any real face time you know so yeah just uh just trying to trying to get noticed in there i guess yeah just, you know fill in the frame helping out yeah you know? <laughs> uh what other scenes uh from that film were you in so that way i can go back and watch and see if i can identify Was in uh, we built this city right that that uh, yeah that, that was a big musical number I love that, that song that took a long time to film um, I forget who I did I, we get handed you know characters all the time I think I, I might have been doing Wayne from Wayne and Wanda <laughs> in the we built the city walking through with tools and stuff yeah but it you know it, it's it, the Muppets I mean if you're a puppeteer and you work for the Muppets. I mean, that doesn't get much better. I mean, they're the most prolific puppet company in the world. You know? Oh, yeah. So yeah. it is a real treat to be able to say that I've worked with the Muppets, you know. So, yeah. very proud. Yeah, and you recently just did the Muppet live shows at the Hollywood Bowl and in London. How were those? Outstanding. Outstanding. Uh, we also did Outside Lands, which was a festival uh, in San Francisco. Right. And I got to work on that. And... I think there was a little bit of hesitation or, or uh, the, the, the guys didn't feel like it was, you know, it was a little scary uh, doing a live concert for like 25 minutes of hands over the head, you know, performing and singing. And, uh, but they built this great set for Dr. Teeth and Electric Mayhem. So it was just Dr. Teeth and the Mayhem performing at Outside Lands. And, uh, so everybody was a little nervous about how it was going to go over, right? Mm -hmm. And they started to push out the set, and it's got animals drum on it. It says Dr. Teeth and Electric Mayhem. And people started clapping. There was only like maybe 150 out in the audience, right? And people started clapping. And it was like at that moment I thought, okay, this, this is going to work. This is going to work really well because these people are just clapping for the set, <laughs> you know? And then uh, – at the end of the show, we all came out and took a curtain call, and you couldn't believe there was like 35,000 people. And the fireworks were going off, it lit up everybody's faces, and everybody was smiling. And that, that's, it was just like, oh, wow, look at every, how, how often do you have that many people together all happy at the same time? <laughs> it was just really a, a great experience, never forget it. And the same with the, the O2 Arena in, in, uh, in London. Uh, just you couldn't believe the love that was being poured out from the audience towards us. I mean, it was the 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 when 
Ozzy first comes out, everybody just screams, and and it was like you had to cover your ears. It was so loud. You know what I mean? So uh, thrilling. Th- those are two favorite. You know, in the top ten for sure, definitely. So um, I would like to ask you something about the Outside Lands uh, show. Uh, what were you doing in that? Like, were you assisting? Well, I mean, obviously you were assisting, but uh, who were you assisting? I was uh, working with Dave Goals as Gonzo. Uh, oh, uh, no, no, not, not Gonzo. Um, uh, Zoo, the sax player. Nice. Because he also had legs, and so he would like, put his legs up on the top of the stage and, and uh, count the beats with him. And, and uh, so I got to work with Dave, which is great. I love Dave. Dave's such a great guy. Nice. And um, they, the, the main performers had a special rig so that they could hold their hands. It was like a cup, kind of a, a rotted right. backpack kind of to be able to support them because they had to be up there for 25 minutes, you know. So mm. that, that really helped make it work. Yeah. So moving on from The Muppets, um, because you've done a lot of other TV and film projects, uh, and as I said in the intro, one of those most popular ones is Imagination Movers, where you got to play Warehouse Mouse. What was that like? That was great. Uh, we, we did four seasons. Uh, we were in uh, New Orleans shooting. Seriously. In New Orleans, and uh, yeah. Uh, well, that's where the, the Imagination Movers are from. Oh, I didn't know that. <laughs> they're they're four guys that do rock and roll for kids, basically, and they wear blue jumpsuits. And uh, I guess they, they were discovered at the, uh, the jazz festival in, in New Orleans, and the, the Disney executive said, hey, let's build a show around them. And so they did. And uh, so they wanted this mouse. Well, one of the guys had a, a puppet, a really cheesy puppet of a, of a mouse, and, and uh, they named it Warehouse Mouse, but they, they're not really puppeteers. So they, they auditioned us, and, and I, I landed the role nice. of the mouse. And the fun, really, any dialogue for the mouse, um, and they wanted to kind of have the mouse be like, uh, you could sort of make out what he was saying, could could understand what he was saying a little bit, Right. so it was kind of like a toddler in learning how to, to talk, uh, you know, the speech development, so over the three seasons at the end, he was able to communicate a little more clearly, which was kind of fun, but I had a guest doing that show, um, and just a bunch of great people to do, you know crew, the, the producers, everybody, the directors, yeah. It's a great show. We had fun. Mm-hmm. That puppet was very have... cute, yeah. I loved that. I thought he was a very cute little character. Yeah, had a lot of fun. Mm. I had a memory of uh, watching Imagination Movers. One of the, I only watched it a couple of times, but one of the times that I did, I was, uh, my grandfather and I were visiting our friend Michelle, who's, this would have been like 2010, 2011, and, um, she had a very young daughter at the time uh, who's uh, a little bit older now. But when I walked into the house, Imagination Movers was playing on the TV. Were, were they enjoying it? Uh, I definitely was. <laughs> As a 11 or 12 year old, I definitely was enjoying it. Good. You know, my, my sister uh, was in Rockford, Illinois as a, as, as a teacher, mm-hmm. uh, a teacher nurse. And, and she told the group of kids that she was uh, that her brother was, you know, played the warehouse mouse. And one kid raised his hand and said, your brother must be small. <laughs> Which, I love that because the kids' imaginations are so, you know, wonderful. Yeah. Unless it was in the case of a character like... Big Bird or Snuffleupagus, Sam the Robot, Sweetums, in which case somebody's actually inside of there. <laughs> right, right. Hmm. One of my favorite pro, uh, projects that you were credited on, um, this is actually a series that ins- was one of the shows that inspired me to want to get into filmmaking, because when I was 16, I actually, I actually went out to L.A. Sorry I uh, missed meeting you there. Um, but my family went to L.A., uh, and I watched a lot of Nickelodeon, and one of the shows I watched was The Thundermans, and that show really inspired me to get into my filmmaking. Um, were you one of the puppeteers of Dr. Colosso on that show? I was. Uh, it was with the Kyoto Brothers. So there was four of us. And uh, I worked uh, a remote mouth little mechanism. Nice. So the, the puppet. So it was really freeing for me. I got to do the voice for Colosso on stage. Oh. And then they would dub it later. 
Yeah. So, so I had so much fun because I got to goof around, and um, that was a fun series. We we had a lot of fun doing that. It was, uh, yeah, I think we did three seasons of that as well. So, and I think it's still airing on Nickelodeon. Yeah, it's. I think. I think it's still airing. Yeah. Uh, we we have Nickelodeon here in Canada, but I don't think the Thundermans is airing on it. We have a similar uh, station called YTV, and they air pretty much all of Nickelodeon's content, including the Thundermans. One of my favorite moments with Colossal on that show was um, after um, Ali after uh, Max meets Allison's parents and kind of screws up their grand opening, and the parents make them break up. So Colosso watches some hockey with um with Max wearing a wig trying to impersonate Allison. <laughs> yeah, there's some funny bits. Yeah. yeah. It's funny how uh uh you know the the character the, the writers weren't quite sure how to utilize him yeah. that well. But after a while I think they realized that they could give they could give me some zingers, you know, to tag the, the scenes or whatever. And so we kind of kept the character going because we were able to, you know, do these zingers and deliver the jokes as the writers wanted them, you know. Nice. And that was important because I think at first it wasn't, they weren't quite sure if it was going to work or not because, you know. When you have a realistic animal like a rabbit, um, you, you kind of get caught uh, trying to be a rabbit but also be a puppet and funny and that sort of thing really good blend of, of uh, you know, doing that, making a, a, a realistic rabbit kind of go outside of itself. Because it's a taunt rabbit, you know. If only I had a possible thumbs. Oh, yeah. He's you, one of those guys. I really wish I could have heard your voice as Colosso now that yeah. now that you're doing it here, um, yeah, which they, was later yeah. dubbed by Dana, Dana, Dana Snyder, I think was his name. Yeah, and, and Dana, you know, he's a, he's a voiceover artist who works all the time. He's really popular. But, you know, I, I there was times where people would go, oh, I, I watched the show and it wasn't your voice and it just didn't seem right, I guess. But, you know, I, I was happy to be working, you know, and uh, and doing the best we could, you know. So yeah. and, and a shout out to the Kyoto brothers, you know, Ed, Steve, and uh, Charlie. I mean, these guys, they, they work so hard in the business. They, they're just great guys. They, uh, they helped me get started with some of the stuff I was doing. Aww. They're very generous, like almost all puppeteers or builders or, or engineers or mechanics, whatever, they, they all kind of go through the Kyoto Brothers at one point. Nice. They get hired. Yeah. So, and the Kyoto Brothers were, um, you know, they did the Killer Clowns from Outer Space. It's, it's like a cult film. It's very funny and strange. I think I've heard of it. Yeah. And then in Pee Wee's Big Adventure, they did the, the stop motion segment with Large March. Tell them Large March sent you, you know, with the... <laughs> The googly eyes and the whole thing. So yeah, they, they do a lot of stuff, and they also have a big Christmas uh, uh, one of their own projects that got picked up by Netflix. It's called uh, Alien Christmas. Oh wow! And uh, that's coming out in Netflix coming up here pretty soon. Oh, congratulations to the Kyoto brothers on that. Did I did I pronounce their name right? Kyoto, yeah, C H I O D O. Kyoto. Mm -hmm. Uh, on the okay. on the last uh, show, I was talking to Mike about somebody that he had. Uh, worked with on uh, Fraggle Rock and a bunch of other things, and uh, it's a very hard to pronounce last name, so um, my, my apologies Frank, for Frank that. Frank Meshkalite. Yes! Was it Frank, Frank Meshkalite? Yeah. Yes. I got to work with uh, Frank on Cats and Dogs. Nice. Up in Canada. Nice. Did you, did you see the first episode of Nostalgia Talk? Oh, I have not. No, sorry. I apologize. Okay. I'm, I'm busy being in a pandemic. Oh, that's, know, that's I've understandable. Got to do an agenda of my time. Yeah, how is how is the pandemic in California actually? Uh, well, it stinks. I mean, you know, we're, LA County is still a hot spot. I mean, we've got ten million people that live in LA County. I mean, that's a lot of people. I mean, and and it's just it's, it's just dragged on so long. People are getting fatigued, and they're not. They're just saying, "Oh, if I get it, I get it." That kind of thing. It's like, no, that's not how you fight a virus like this. You know, everyone's got to be on board. Mm -hmm. um, and most people are. I mean. Most people are, are conscientious, and, and but, you know, I think there's some, I, 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 I'm just going to say it, I think we had some failed leadership over this whole thing. And I think America could have taken a, a real uh, stronghold in helping to stop this virus before it really got to where it is now. But that's something else we could talk about later. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I watched last night's debate. It went better than the last one, honestly. Yeah, yeah. And, and I understand Canada now has uh, a, a up, uptick in their cases. What? Yeah. yeah. And it's, yeah, it's, it's going to be around for a while. And I think mask wearing is just going to be the norm. Mm-hmm. We just have to do it, you know? Yeah, absolutely. So, as we wrap up the Q&A, uh, I, I usually end the uh, show with some fan questions. I only have one little fan question after the Q&A, uh, but as we wrap up the Q&A, I would like to talk about um, a project that I haven't mentioned yet that you're quite well known for. The Adventures of Timmy the Tooth. Yes, Timmy the Tooth. Yeah. So, how did that all start and more importantly what's Timmy's backstory like was he living in someone else's mouth before <laughs> this is the original the original drawing that they built the puppets from nice uh, well uh, my uh, my partners uh james murray and dina Ferboni, we we were doing these uh a timmy the tooth variety show which was nothing like what it is now it was just a, a kids puppet show that we did we performed in theaters here in, in Los Angeles in Burbank, actually. Cool. Uh, we were tearing down the stage, and we thought, you know what? This this went over really well. Let's uh, take it to the next level. So we decided to um, work on it and develop it to make it a video home video series. Because this was at the same time Barney was real popular. And a lot of the studios were, were baffled by how a non-studio independent group could have that much distribution with their home video sales. And it was just that parents wanted home video to play for their kids growing up. And at that time I had, you know, two two boys, you know, about two and and four at that okay. time. Uh, years of old, you know, years old. And so they, they you know were part of the inspiration to, you know, create a good kids show that parents could watch with their kids, the good music and the you know, the good positive messages and whatnot. So we actually developed it and uh, turned Timmy into a young adventurer boy, but Brush Brush remained as his sidekick, you know. Uh, I love Brush and, Brush. Uh, we sold it to Universal. Yeah, we sold it to Universal, and uh, they, they picked it up and gave us the money to do 10 half hours, and, and that was a great, great experience. We, we had, you know, over 100 people working, you know, on the show as painters and electricians and, uh, you know, the whole gamut of production. So that was kind of rewarding to have that. Here's Brush Brush. Aww. <laughs> that's, abs- um, yeah. that's absolutely so, adorable. Yeah, it was a great experience, you know. And, uh, we, we, and you know, Alan Troutman and Bruce and Todd Maddox and uh, Cheryl Blaylock. I mean, we had all these top puppeteers uh, working on it. Uh, Greg Ballura, Chris... Christine Papalex. Michael Earl, who's uh, Michael unfortunately Earl. no longer with us. And Michael, Michael did my uh, did the remote eyes for Timmy, and I, I just cool. love Michael so much because he could do stuff with the eyes. You know, because he he have a remote, so he's sitting about fifty feet away, and he's got the remote doing the eyes. And and Timmy was kind of a heavy puppet, so it was like when I had to do like listening and do stuff. He would do all the acting with his face, with the with the uh, with the eyes and the lids, and it's like so. I just had to hold him up, and, and Michael could do the thinking for me. And, uh, and there were times where we were so connected, and he would lead me sometimes, and I would lead him, uh, like when we turn and make sure the eyes go the right way. Uh, yeah, I miss Michael because he was so great, and just he was one of those guys, very generous and giving kind of person who would who would help you. With not making it sound like you know well, no do it this way he was like hey what if you try you know he's just such a sweetheart of a guy and he made it he made everybody better which was Aww. you know a real testament he was you know yeah and, and, and he was way way too early yeah and michael also performed on sesame street for a little while where he did snuffle up against right. forgetful jones and slimy the worm among others yeah mm. yeah yeah i got a little surprise so, okay. um, as I mentioned before, I got a Timmy the Tooth VHS tape from Value Village. Um, do they, first of all, do they have Value Village in the States? No, but I can imagine it's what it is. Okay, yeah. My, it's, <laughs> Value, Value Village. Yeah, it's like my favorite place to shop. So, I opened the tape to put it into my VCR TV, and it came with this, 
it's like a wallet sized picture where you can have like a right. where you can like have a picture uh, of you or maybe even yeah. of your kids and on the back it says here's a picture your of son or daughter or, or your dog <laughs> yeah they'd get along well with brush brush given his dog like personality uh, so on the back it says here's a picture of blank and underneath it says your name with Timmy the Tooth, Brush Brush, and all their friends too, I think it's great, and they all think so too. And it also came with this little booklet for merchandise from Universal, such as Timmy the Tooth uh, yeah. merchandise. Like uh, this looks like a lunch bag, I think. It's a tote bag. Yeah. Okay, close enough. Um, that was all Universal's doing. Really. And it also came with, um, yeah. it also had uh, advertisements for videotapes. I've only got the one videotape right now. Uh, for some reason, it also has a uh, Rice Krispies thing in here. Right. And a recipe for Rice Krispies, what looks like a coupon for it, too, I think. So look at, so we were on all these, all these uh, boxes. Oh, wow. And they gave away a free video. And so there's, there's Timmy and there's Brush Brush and Cavity Goon and Sweetie. Nice. And Johnny Paste. And so uh, that was part of the launch with um, with Universal. I mean, they, they made a deal with Rice Krispies to give away a video if you wrote in with the box top. And, and uh, so they gave away a video for, for, for free. And it was a huge uh, marketing because we were in every grocery store in America and abroad too, so yeah. uh, that yeah. was a huge part of the launch, made it successful. Yeah, I think that was my first introduction to Timmy the Tooth, because I remember seeing the tapes at uh, Superstore here in Nova Scotia. Blockbuster. Yeah. Okay. I don't think yeah. I saw them like at... a video store, yeah, Blockbuster. I don't think I ever saw them at Blockbuster. When we had block... Blockbuster was a big, huge push for us too, because people yeah. loved to rent something their kids could watch. Yeah, and the uh, the booklet also has these ads for uh, Land Before Time and the movie Casper. And it's funny, I just watched Casper the other night, because with Halloween coming up. Right, good. And it also has an ad for a little stuffed toy <laughs> of Timmy. Yep, little stuffed Timmy. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's funny, because when those first came out, uh, the, the it, you know, I think they had them made in China, right? The little Timmy's. And the eye big, but they were just off a little bit, a little wonky. <laughs> it was like, it was creepy. <laughs> but we were That's happy cute. they were doing stuff like that, you know, yeah. to kind of keep the brand going, you know. I've been watching the um, little YouTube videos with um, with Timmy that have come out a little bit recently. Uh, is that Timmy Puppet the original Timmy? It is the original Timmy. Wow. Uh, and he still works, uh, which is amazing. It's like those, those servos in his head for his eyes and whatnot. Those are, you know, almost 25 years old. I was going to say. And, uh, yeah. it's, what's funny is that he's, it's loud. So when you make him blink, it's like... Isn't the technology so great? It's a little loud. It's like you can hear his thoughts or something, you know. Yeah, my, my partner James and I, you know, during the pandemic, we were just going nuts. It's like, well, we got to do something. And so we, we uh, started doing these little pandemic little things with his character Puppet G, who's a puppet guru. Cool. We just thought it'd be funny if Timmy calls his puppet guru to, you know, complain about things. <laughs> nice. And it just kind of escalated from there. Mm. Well, now that the show has been streaming on uh, Peacock, and in addition to that, you've got the little YouTube series, do you think it's possible that a reboot of that show would ever happen? Possible. I, you know, I, I think it would take a uh, some people at, at Universal to realize that, yeah, they could reboot and do more. Um, we'll see, you know, who yeah. knows? If it ever does get rebooted, I would, like, if it ever gets rebooted when I'm out of film school, I'd love to write and direct for it, so. Okay, I'll, let me write you, let me get your name down here. I'll okay, down cool. <laughs> <laughs> um, so last question I got, uh, it's a fan oh, question. Yeah, oh, Little picture there of Timmy and Brush Brush. That's cute. <laughs> hey everybody, it's me, Timmy the Tooth and Brush Brush. 
I'm sure a lot of uh, people who are watching this who grew up watching Timmy the Tooth are probably just nerding out at this point. Yeah. It, it is kind of funny how it, 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 for the longest time, people would put up clips on YouTube and then people would parody it and make fun of it. and and uh, But that's okay. You know, we didn't mind. It's like just a little, it's a little advertisement for us in a way. Yeah. Well, it shows <laughs> so, that people yeah, still definitely... It, it shows that people definitely still care. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Some people um, have have commented like the cavity goons scared them so much. Oh wow! That they would brush their mm. brush their teeth incessantly. Well, that was a good lesson <laughs> and then. then. Also, they probably need therapy. <laughs> <laughs> mm. All right. So this is the last question I got. It's a fan question um, from my father. Actually, is that cavity goon right there? Yes, it is. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's all right. That was, a, that was... That was a, like an original. Cavity goon. It looks... I'm kind of glad that you went with the cavity goon puppet that you um, that you ended up using. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He was goofy, and and uh, we loved having the sidekicks. We really soften him up a little bit, you know, yeah. make him less more goofy. Yeah. All right. So, last question I got here is a fan question from my dad, Brendan Nobes. And he wants to know, um, what puppeteer do you think you learned the most from in your career? Oh, interesting. Uh, I think, for me, it was watching Frank Meskele, okay. a Canadian puppeteer. Uh, we, we were working on a, uh, on a uh, rock and roll video for kids type thing. And he was the lead character, like a squirrel. Okay. And um, uh, he, he was the lead, and so he, he would be working almost all the shots and then the the director called a 10 minute break or whatever but frank decided to stay and just work the camera and just play doing stuff and and uh i remember watching him because the script supervisor was watching him too and snickering and then i watched i watched it with him and i realized he could be resting you know but instead he's discovering and this character is he's he's finding the joy in the work and and finding new things playing with space i mean i think it was as silly as he was picking a booger and eating it oh my <laughs> it's a, god but it's a squirrel you know a, but then playing just playing with the whole camera space and i realized i go oh yeah now here's here's a guy who, who who should be resting like if i were me i'd be resting and like just trying to catch my breath but he's still working and finding these little nuances and things and so he didn't settle and level off and i i, I realized i go Maybe I've leveled off. Maybe I need to continue to work to get better. And I think that was really inspiring. inspiring. So thank your Dad, for that question, because uh, that's a good one. Okay. So uh, that's, all I, uh, that's all I've got. Uh, so, Kevin, thank you again very much for uh, agreeing to chat. Yeah. And uh, thank you to the viewers for, um, for listening to Kevin talk. Uh, so until next time, uh, and again, this series won't, you know, it's, it's just an activity, so it won't, be totally regular, but I'll probably have a lot more YouTube content coming. I'm trying to get my friends to do more best friends challenge videos. I did one with my first friend Rachel where we tried to see how much we know about each other, and um, I, I enjoyed doing that. So I'm going to try to get more of my friends to do those. Uh, but until then, peace!